Well, uh, once again, thanks so much for being here. And uh, yeah, we're kicking off a new series today called Songs for Anxious Souls. And I think, you know, we live in times of strife. We live in times of tension. If you open your phone, you feel like you're constantly being blasted with just uh, distressing, upsetting events. And, all, and these events matter. They're of consequence. We certainly don't want to put our head into the sand. Um, but if we allow these things to shape us, we can be plunged into outrage and panic. And, uh, and what's kind of neat about this service is we flowed from visual medium into song, and now we're actually going into poetry, because that's what the book of Psalms is in the Hebrew Bible. It's, uh, it's Hebrew poetry. And it's been said that poetry is emotion distilled. And I don't know how much you read poetry. You're, you're maybe familiar with the, the most famous ones like Tennyson or Emily Dickinson or Shakespeare or, or you know, uh, whatever kind of poetry you're familiar with. But uh, Adam Kirsch is a poet and a literary critic at Columbia University. And he said regarding the Psalms, he says, no poems have been read more widely or deeply than the Psalms. From medieval to modern times, they were seen as indispensable. They offered early moderns the very scripts of their own inner lives. So these are the most famous poems basically ever written. I mean, these are poems that we're reading, people read all around the world, 3,000 years later. I don't even think anybody's going to be reading Taylor Swift lyrics in 3,000 years. Maybe Kendrick, you know, maybe Kendrick will, you know, be able to pull that off. Not likely, but, but 3,000 years later, people all around the world in different languages are still reading this book of poems. And the word psalm, you know, you, you, you come around church and you hear all these words you've never heard before. The word psalm uh, comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and uh, it actually means song because that's what it was. This was like the, 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 this was the top 40 playlist that was like banging in ancient Israel, all right? These were the bangers that made it through. And uh, it's actually divided up into five books, just a little factoid. The book of Psalms is divided up into five books. And uh, some scholars hesitate to call it a hymn book because a hymn book kind of is like random. You just select a random hymn. It's like turn in your hymnal to song, uh, hymn 55 or whatever. The Psalms are different because they were deliberately arranged into a story arc. They were deliberately arranged into a storyline. You know, it starts off talking about the wisdom of God and then the hope of the Messiah who's going to bring the kingdom of God. And then you go through, and what's really beautiful, the story arc, I'm going to kind of give you the whole story arc of the book of Psalms, is that at the beginning of it, it starts out with all of this lament, all of this wailing, these mourning Psalms. But then as you go through the Psalms, there's wailing and wailing and mourning and lament, and they're kind of mixed in with some praise. And then, and then gradually you go from lament to praise. You gradually go from grief to gratitude. You go from mourning to rejoicing. And by the time you get to Psalm 150, it's all praise. It's all song. It's all joy. And what's the message? You know, as you see in this passage, it's very real. It's very raw. It's very human. He's going, God, have you forgotten me? God, do you even care about me? Do you even see me? Does it even matter to you, God? It's raw. It's real. It's visceral. It's not polished. But what the Psalms teach us is that if you come to God in that authenticity, if you come to God in that brokenness and in that vulnerability, crying out because the world is screwed up, that as you continually bring your real self to God, gradually he'll eventually turn you into a person of peace and joy. And that's the story arc of the Psalms. So don't stuff it. Don't hide it. Don't fake it. God wants your real self. And I think artists sometimes are the best at that. <laughs> I think artists are sometimes the best at being uh, real and not fake and, and, and not being phony. And that's actually our first thought. I uh, usually like to divide a talk up into, into points, just kind of keep people moving along. They're like mile markers. But our first point is this. God would rather have real rage than plastic prayers. God would rather have real rage than plastic prayers. Uh, verse 1, how long, O Lord, 
Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day, having sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? So this is a psalm written by David. Most of you probably heard of David and Goliath. Uh, David becomes the king, but he doesn't start off as the king. The first king is this dude, Saul, and he is a psychopath, all right? He is a megalomaniac. He is a narcissist. He is paranoid. He'd actually make a great American candidate, you know? <laughs> like, like he's, he's just, he's, he's off his rocker, and he hunts David down like a dog for 15 years. David is a fugitive. David knows he's going to be the ultimate king. He'd been anointed, but, but it takes 15 years for David to actually be enthroned, and he's on the run for his life for 15 years. And so here's David in anger, in, in fury, and David was a musician, okay? He was a, he was a poet and a, and a harp player. He was a musician, and here in his anger and his rage, he's saying, God, do you even care? Do you even see? Like, how long are you going to forget me? He, 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 one commentator said he, this psalm is almost a howl. It's a howl that comes up. But he brings his howl to God. He comes to God with his disappointment and frustration and rage. I don't know if you've ever been around like fake, phony Christians. <laughs> fake, phony Christians who are like, you know, no, praise the Lord. You know, and you're like, no, my life is really hard and horrible. They're like, no, you've got a choice to rejoice. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. You're like, oh my God, how do I turn you off? Like, get away from me. You know, you know like, <laughs> it's, it's just so frustrating. And I want to tell you, Church culture or Christian culture is not always the same thing as scriptural culture. What's committed in Jesus' name is not always the same as what's commanded in Jesus' word. And, and what we need to do is, we, if we're going to be a counterculture, is we need to choose to say, hey, we're not going to worry about Christian culture or church culture, we're going to align ourselves with what the scripture teaches. And the scripture gives you permission to be real. The, the, the scripture gives you permission to admit when you're in pain, to admit when you're angry, to admit when you're frustrated, to admit, admit when, you're, when you're even mad at God. The fact that there's so many Psalms like this included in the Bible says God knows how we speak when we're desperate. And he's okay with it. He's not intimidated by it. Have you ever been in that position where you need that language of lament? Have you ever been in that place where you're asking how long? How long am I going to battle depression? How long am I going to be alone? How long am I going to be struggling to pay my rent? How long am I going to have chronic pain? How long... Am, am, am I going to be dealing with the, the residual effects of trauma? How long? How long? How long? You know, and then some things we say collectively. You know, when a corporation makes a disgusting, depraved decision to release a chicken Big Mac, we say, how long, O oh Lord? <laughs> we are horrified. What man has wrought... <laughs> But seriously, you know, some of our how longs are collective, aren't they? How long are there going to be horrible bombings where children are caught in the collateral damage? How long are our, our government that's meant to protect us going to terrorize the most vulnerable citizens, minority groups? You know, how long are, are, are people going to profit, uh, corporations going to profit off the pain of people? How long are there going to be overdoses on our streets? How long are there going to be women and sometimes children caught in sex trafficking, being exploited around the world and in our town? How long? How long? How long? And David, he directs this anger at God. He goes, how long are you going to look the other way? How long are you not going to do anything about it? The message of Psalms is that you can bring your real feelings to God. You can bring your real anxieties to God. God wants the real you. But if we continually come with our anger and our pain and we choose to run to God instead of from God, 
The book of Psalms, even this one in particular, the reason why I chose it is because Psalm 13 basically follows the outline of the entire book of Psalms, is that it starts with rage, it starts with lament, but as he brings his feelings to God, he is stabilized, and he ends in peace, he ends in confidence, he ends praising God eventually. And I want to emphasize eventually. Next thought is this. The future turned out to be an anxious one. The future turned out to be an anxious one. Look with me in verse 2. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? I like the way the New Living Translation puts this. It says, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul and sorrow in my heart every day? Uh, like many people in this room and certainly many people in our nation, I have a diagnosed mental health disorder. You know, I have a, I have a diagnosed mental health condition, and I'm certainly not the only one. Uh, Gallupol said that we have reached the highest rates in American history of anxiety and depression. The, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy says that Mental health is the defining crisis of our time. And when I read Psalm 13, verse 2, I recognize it. How long will I battle with my thoughts and have sorrow in my heart day after day? You want to know what clinical depression, clinical anxiety feels like? It feels like a broken washing machine. They can't turn off, and it's just churning and churning and churning, and you're just thinking these stressed out, worried, anxious, depressed, pessimistic thoughts, and you want to turn it off, but it's broken. It just keeps going and going and going like an like a old, beat-up washing machine, old, beat-up dryer going on and on forever. But what's interesting is that modern people can say verse 2, because more Americans than ever before have anxiety and depression. So Americans can say verse 2, but what's tragic is that Americans can't say verse 5. Many Americans, you know, modern people, can't even say verse 1. What do I mean? Is that we have the, the thoughts that go on day and night, but we don't have a God to bring them to. Many people don't believe in God. You know, we're, we, li we are living in a secular age. We're living in the future, right? I mean, there's Tesla taxis, and there's artificial intelligence, and, and, and there's vaccines, and there's all, all of these, you know, the cyber truck. Oh, how long, oh Lord, how long? But like, like, like there's, there's all these things. But I'm asking, does it feel like utopia? You know, in, in the turn of the 20th century, there were the original four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse. There was Nietzsche, Marx, Freud, and Darwin. These were the original guys, and, and they had seismic impact. I'm sure you've heard of most of them. You know, Darwin and Freud for sure, Marx, and then Friedrich Nietzsche. And, and, and they ushered in a secular age. They ushered in a world where God was dead. And Nietzsche had the wisdom to recognize that this was cataclysmic, this was catastrophic. But People, you know, that didn't fit with sensibilities. People became very optimistic. They thought, you know, in this age guided by science, guided by reason, we're going to bring about progress. Every tomorrow is going to be brighter than every yesterday. There's a British historian who was born in 1889 named uh, Anthony, or sorry, Arnold um, Toynbee, and he says this, we expected that life throughout the world would become more rational more humane, more socially just. We had expected that the progress of science and technology would make Mein richer, and that this increasing wealth would gradually spread from a minority to a majority. Yeah, no, it didn't exactly work out that way, I don't think, all Portland said. But uh, we had expected that all this would happen peacefully. In fact, we thought that mankind's course was set for an earthly paradise. However, this optimism was shattered by two world wars. So that was the hope, you know. We usher this secular era guided by science, and we thought, oh, we're going we're to bring about paradise on earth, progress. And then instead, 
millions upon millions upon millions. The 20th century was the bloodiest century of human history. But then in the 1990s, there was a resurgence of optimism. There was this great optimism, again, you know, the internet. The internet's going to solve our problems. And you can read quotes by futurists and techno-optimists like Mark and Dressen, Silicon Valley types, who say, you know, we had a problem with cold, so we invented indoor heating. We had a problem of, uh, of, of darkness, so we invented the electric light. And we had a problem with isolation and loneliness, so we invented the internet. <laughs> now, 59% of Americans say that they're lonely. The vast majority of young people say they wish social media was never invented. And you, you can read quote after quote of you know, the, the optimism that there was. John Allen, uh, an author and an enthusiast of the internet in 1993, there's this clip of him that's just so ironic. He goes, the internet, it's a place of civility and restraint. It's a, it's a place of human fellowship. It's like... If only this guy heard about 4chan or <laughs> read it. So it didn't work out quite so well, Mr. Allen. I mean, let alone QAnon. You know, the information age very quickly became the age of misinformation and disinformation. You know, it, didn't, it didn't work out. The optimism didn't come for us. And now where do we stand today? There is war between Russia and Ukraine that's dragging on and the body toll keeps rising. There's uh, kind of some of the craziest things we've ever seen in the Middle East happening with Israel and, and Lebanon and, and Gaza and Iran, and it, 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 it's, it's all boiling over. You know that Denmark, I mean, we usually look to the Scandinavian countries as our example of progress. You know Denmark reinstituted the draft this year? Literally. Denmark reinstituted the draft. You, you can read scholars on every publication talking about fears of civil war in the United States. There are assassination attempts happening before our eyes. I just am coming to ask this simple question. Has secularism delivered on its promise? Does this feel like paradise? Does this feel like utopia? Now, I have clinical depression. I've shared my story at length in the past, but I'm going to share a different story. Uh, I remember I got a message, because, you know, social media, good things can happen even if something's flawed and broken, right? But I get a message on Facebook from a mom who, go, who had seen me open up about my battle with depression, and she said, hey, I'm really worried about my son. You know, he's, he's uh, going to graduate school, but I really think he's going to commit suicide, Will you, will you reach out to him? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll reach out to him. So I reach out to this guy. We'll call him, you know, we'll call him John, just for the sake of it. So I reach out to John. It's not his real name, but reach out to John. And, uh, and he ghosts me, right? He doesn't write me back. I'm just some random pastor, some random stranger. Like, why would he write me back? Well, about four weeks later, five weeks later, his girlfriend breaks up with him. And he had already been battling serious depression. And so his girlfriend breaks up and he writes me back. So we meet up for coffee. And I remember going to meet John and his eyes were sunken in and I recognized it. The look on his face was a look I had had years earlier. You know, and he, his eyes were sunken in. He was, he was, he was gaunt. He was frail. I, I, I knew exactly what he was going through. I knew that depression could be so bad that just being alive felt like walking on two broken ankles. And I also want to say here, I'm a huge fan and believer of like practitioners and mental health professionals. I'm grateful for them, therapists, medication. I've benefited from all of these things. But friendship is so important too. And, and, I, and I ultimately want to say a worldview of hope and joy and confidence and faith is important too. But so I meet with Ryan, and, and he opens up to me that he's an atheist. And I don't care. I love hanging out with atheists. I'll hang out with anybody. Like, I, I just like to hang out. So, so I'm hanging out with, with, uh, with John, and, um, and we continue to hang, you know, just hang out, get together every once in a while. You know, one day, I, you know, I can tell he's just going through a really difficult time, so I like I, he, he gives me his address. I just surprise him at his house with like his favorite food. And we just kind of continue to hang out and months go by. And one day we're hanging out 
And it's just his whole, his whole body starts to change. His whole demeanor, his whole countenance starts to change. I remember the one day I'm talking to him, and I'm like, yeah, you know, and I think this, you know, you know uh, people need to be more gracious, sympathetic towards atheists. You know, I know you're an atheist. He says, hey, don't call me an atheist. I'm not an atheist anymore. You know, and, and we just continue to hang out. And, and guess what? What's so cool is that John is thriving now. He's thriving just as a person. Uh, you know, he's, he, he, he went on, he got his graduate degree. He's, he's uh, actually had a baby. He's just like thriving as a human being. And, uh, and, and I believe those stories are possible for Portland. I believe those stories are possible. That's why we started this church. All right, the final thought this morning is this. Rejoice in the right thing, and you'll end up with peace. Rejoice in the right thing, and you'll end up with peace. Look at verse 5. This is the verse I was saying, hey, you know, if you adopt a materialist view of reality, you can't, you can't say verse 5 or verse 6. You can say verse 2. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Now rejoice is a little bit of a churchy word. I mean, I think everybody understands it, but it's a little bit of a churchy word. But, but, but the, the biblical concept of rejoicing goes deeper than just like celebrate, woohoo, happy birthday, celebrating a party. It's deeper than that. It's what do you look to for your joy? What do you look to for your fulfillment? What do you believe is going to give your life meaning? What do you believe is going to give your life satisfaction? What, what, what is the thing that gets you up out of bed in the morning? What's the thing that if you lost it, life wouldn't be worth living? That is what you rejoice in. And if you rejoice in your career, you're going to be stressed out a lot of the time. If your career is what you really look to for joy, it, it's going to leave you empty. If you rejoice in your children... Maybe being a mom, having kids, being a dad, you know, that's great. I, lo I love having kids. That that's a good thing. But if that's what you get your joy from, if that's what you get your identity from, if you, if you get your meaning from your children, you will crush them with your expectations. You will crush them. If you get your joy from your significant other, you get your joy from your romantic partner, it's going to be up and down. You know, when they break up you, you're not going to want to live anymore. It's, it's, it's going to be constant chaos and, and, and dysfunction. If you get your joy from a political party or political candidate, I mean, it, it, you, we, we all see the results of that. People looking at their meaning in life, it, it just leads to absolute strife and anger. You see, what will happen is you'll, if you get your joy from anything other than God, on the one hand, you're going to be a person of anger. You're going to be a person of compromise because you're going to be compromising your values. You go, why did I compromise my values? Well, it's because you were doing it to get the thing that you rejoice in. You're going to be a person of regret or on the opposite hand of it or sometimes altogether, you're going to be a person of panic and fear and anxiety. Why will you be a person of panic and fear and anxiety? Because you're rejoicing in something that is easily threatened. You're rejoicing in something that is easily lost. You're, you're rejoicing in something that's transient. But what David does, as he brings his anger and his fear about his enemies, because he has real enemies, as he brings them to God, he's reminded, he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Being enthroned, get, you know, having my, my military success, my political achievements, my career, that's not my joy. You're my joy. You're the thing that I trust in, and I trust in you. And so he ends his psalm, not in anger and anxiety and terror, he ends his song in confidence and in praise. And I think it's also cool because he goes, I will sing the Lord's praise for he's been good to me. Now, like I said, I have clinical depression. And what uh, professionals tell you is that, that, that our brains play tricks on us. There's something called cognitive distortions. It's distorted thinking where your thoughts become exaggerated and distorted. And there's all kinds of different kinds of them. There's magnification, minimization. There's catastrophic thinking. There's polarized thinking. Uh, there's fortune telling, mind reading. All, all, all of these just like blown out of proportion thoughts that are like a funhouse mirror at a circus. You know, it's just these exaggerated thoughts, these exaggerated thoughts. But what's amazing here is as David takes his eyes off of his uh, circumstances and the transient things that he puts them on God, his thoughts become more realistic. 
Because how do we act when we're, when we're anxious, when we're depressed? We go, everything's terrible. Nobody likes me. You always do this. You always do that. We generalize. But as David puts his eyes on God, how does he end the psalm? He says, I will sing to the Lord because he's been good to me. It hasn't been all bad. There have been some good times. There's been some good things that have happened. Like, it hasn't been all terrible. And as you stop idolizing whatever that thing is for you, because we all do it, we all rejoice in our, in our career, or maybe it's our, how well our art is received, or how many Instagram followers we have. As we stop um, blowing that one thing out of proportion, and we put our eyes on God, our vision becomes more realistic across the board. And we can see that God has been good to us. I'm going to bring the band back up on stage. We'll end out today. Um, Psalms are pretty amazing, aren't they? <laughs> like, it's, it's so cool. And uh, I'm going to bring this message in for a landing in just a second. But I also want to say this, you know, this is going to be an eight-week series in the Psalms, and I just want to invite you to come on out for it. You know, come on out. There's so much benefit to being together, benefit to singing together. You know, if this has helped you today, I just want to invite you to come back next week. Come back. You know, it's going to be good. We're, I'm going to be here every week. <laughs> I'm be here every Sunday. But, uh, but I want to end just pointing to Jesus. If you're new to the Bible, what's really cool is that Jesus is David's descendant. You know, he, he's, David is his ancestor, and he's called the son of David. Eventually, David becomes king. Jesus is the greater king. And in this text, it's so interesting because David feels forsaken by God. He's worried about his enemies triumphing over him. But the son of David, he comes, and guess what? Jesus doesn't just feel forsaken by God. He is forsaken by God. Jesus isn't just worried about his enemies triumphing over them. They actually do. They execute him. And a lot of us know something that is so crucial, and that's this, that, that Jesus died for us. We remember that every week with communion, that he died for our sins. But here's something else that the Bible teaches, I feel like gets neglected, is that Jesus died with us. That he knows what you're going through. He knows your pain. Jesus is the empathy of God. He literally put himself in our shoes. And that's what we remember with communion. God, I pray that, uh, that you'd speak right now just to each of our hearts. We thank you for art. We thank you for beauty. We thank you for grand, majestic vistas and sand dunes and, and oceans. We thank you for song, for poetry, just for the good gifts that you give us, that it hasn't all been bad. You've dealt bountifully with us. And God, I thank you that even though this world is broken and there's cause for lament, there's so much cause for anger and frustration and, and, and sadness and brokenheartedness. We thank you that you chose to write yourself into our story. That you didn't just send a, a courier, an errand boy, messenger but you actually came you are the message God you came you're the empathy you're so empathetic that you came and you walked in our shoes you died the death that we deserve you rose from the grave to give us hope Lord so that we could end in praise thank you for, thank you for this time together in Jesus name <laughs>